we're going to go ahead and get started, folks. I will now call to order the meeting of the Omaha Planning Board. The planning board members that are here today are Trenton Magid, David Rosacker, Jeffrey Moore, Michael Pate, Patrick Morse, Christine Carnes, our vice chair, just left. She didn't feel well. I am Greg Rosenbaum, chairman. Members of the city staff that are in attendance today are Dave Fanslaw, planning director, Sherry Rockwell, acting assistant planning director, Eric England, planning manager, Mike Carter, planning board administrator, Alan Thielen from the city law department, and Debbie Hightower and Lisa Agins, secretaries. Our rules of procedure are as follows. Notice of this hearing has been published. This board met this morning, reviewed all the cases, and visually inspected sites. Copies of today's agenda are located on the table in front of us. You are welcome to come down and pick one up. They are just right here, folks, if you need one. The cases on the consent agenda will be heard first. Consent cases are perceived by the planning board to be non-controversial, have already been heard, or been recommended for layover, and therefore will be read and voted on without the opportunity for your testimony. If you wish to testify, you may remove the case from the consent agenda. When each consent case is read, I will ask if anyone wants the case removed. If you do, please stand up and say so, and the case will be removed. These cases will then be heard in the order in which it appears on the regular agenda after we go through the consent cases. When the case is heard, you will have the opportunity to come to the podium, state your name and address, and give your testimony at that time. When hearing cases on the regular agenda, the board will first hear from the applicant. After the applicant states their case, we will hear from the proponents, and then we will hear from the opponents. After both sides are heard, the public hearing will be closed and no additional testimony will be permitted unless a board member requests additional information. When at the podium, please state your name, address, and whom you are representing for the record. Your testimony is very important to us. In the interest of time and courtesy to others, please be short and to the point. We will try to limit each case to 10 minutes. Those directly involved in the case Please speak first. We request that large groups select a spokesperson to represent that group, therefore eliminating repetitive testimony. When given testimony, please provide new information and try not to repeat what has previously been said. We do ask that all speakers and others be treated with courtesy and with respect. In that regard, please remain silent while seated and please turn off your cell phones. Our decision to approve, deny, or continue a case made here today will be forwarded to the City Council for another public hearing and final disposition by the City Council. Conditional use permits are an exception to this rule. The Board's decision made here today on conditional use permits are final and not forwarded to the City Council. Lastly, upon the advice of the Law Department, all communications to the Board members from attorneys or other interested parties should be transmitted through the planning department so that they are made a part of the public record. The department will then transmit all that information to the board as well as to the rest of the public. Rezoning matters are an exception to this rule. Before I start with the uh, consent cases, uh, agenda item number 11 has been withdrawn. So that case has been withdrawn, will not be taken up at this time. All right. The consent cases. Agenda item number three, case C10-14-44, C12-14-45, applicant David Steyer and Ken Hagen. It is on consent for approval. Request revised preliminary plat approval of Majestic Point, lots 244 through 252, and out lots I through N, a subdivision outside the city limits with rezoning from AG to DR and MU. This was laid over from the June 6th meeting. Location, southwest of 168th and State Streets. 
Does anyone wish to have this removed from consent agenda? Seeing none. Agenda item number eight, KC 10 18 162, C 12 18 163. Applicant, Holy Name Housing Corporation. It is on for approval. Request preliminary and final plat approval of Villa Rose on 15th, a minor plat inside the city limits with rezoning from R535 and CC to R7. Location 3107 and 3119 South 15th Street. Does anyone wish to have this removed from consent? Okay, seeing none. <clears throat> Agenda item number nine, KC 10 18 164, C 12 18 165. <coughs> Applicant Donald and Danella Sweezy. It is on for approval. Request preliminary and final plat approval of Sweezy Acres, a minor plat outside the city limits with rezoning from AG to DR. Portions of the property is located within an ED Environmental Resources Overlay District. Location, southeast of Blair High Road and Pawnee Road. Does anyone wish to have this removed from consent? Seeing none, agenda item number 10, KC 10-18-166, C 12-18-167. Applicant, Frank. Krejci Trust, it is on for layover. Request preliminary plat approval of Legend Trails, lots 1 through 90, outlots A through F, a subdivision outside the city limits with waivers to section 53-82 street width, section 53-93 curb and gutter, and section 53-99 sidewalks along with rezoning from AG to DR. Location, northwest of 222nd and Q Street. Does anyone wish to have this removed? Agenda item number 12, KC 10-18-168. Applicant, Woodsonia Real Estate. It is on for approval. Request approval of an MCC major commercial corridor overlay district. Location 5645 North 90th Street. Does anyone wish to have this removed from consent? Seeing none. Agenda item number 15, KC 10 18 171. Applicant City of Omaha. It is on for approval. Request rezoning from GI to R5, location 1708 Sailor Street. Does anyone wish to have this removed from consent agenda? Seeing none, agenda item number 17, case C10-18-172, C11-18-173, applicant Eric Wiesler. It is on for layover. Request Rezoning from GC and R7 to R7 along with approval of a planned unit redevelopment overlay district. Property is located within an NCE neighborhood conservation enhancement district. Location southeast of 10th and Pierce Streets. Does anyone wish to have this removed from consent? Seeing none. Agenda item number 18, KC 10 18 174, C 7 8 166, C 7 97 225. Applicant, Tim Jacoby, Children's Hospital Foundation. It is on for approval. Request approval of a major amendment to a conditional use permit to allow hospital services general in a geo district. Property is located within an ACI 265 overlay district and approval of the expansion of the ACI 2 overlay district. Location, northeast of 84th and Dodge Street and northwest of 84th Street and Indian Hills Drive. 
Does anyone wish to have this removed from consent? Seeing none, agenda item number 19, case C10-00-40, applicant SCM 10X Omaha 14901 LLC. It is on for layover. Request approval of a major amendment to the mixed use district development agreement for Greyhawk. Location 14901 West Maple Road. Anyone wish to have this removed from consent? Seeing none. And finally, agenda item number 20, case C7. 18 175 applicant Geraldo Velar Fernandez. It is on for approval. Request approval of a conditional use permit to allow automotive sales in an NBD. Property is located within an ACI overlay district, location 5026 South 24th Street. Does anyone wish to have this removed from consent? Okay, that are the con those are the consent cases. I will t entertain a motion for approval of the consent cases. Making a motion for the approval of cases number 3, 8, 9, 12, 15, 18, and 20 as contained in the agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you please record the vote? Megan? Yes. Rosecker? Yes. Moore? Yes. Mr. Pate? Yes. Mr. Morris? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Do we have a motion for layover cases on consent? Motion to layover cases 17 and 19? And 10. And 10. And 10, I'm sorry. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Mr. Rosecker? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Pate? Yes. Mr. Morris? Yes. Mr. Magid? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Okay, the cases that we just went over on consent, those are done. No further action will be taken today. If you were here for one of those cases, you are welcome to leave or you're welcome to stay and watch the proceedings. We'll move on with the first two cases. They are administrative only. That means no public testimony will be taken on the first two cases. Agenda item number one is case C10-18-61, C12-18-62. Applicant, Winsonia, <coughs> excuse me, Woodsonia 204 Center, LLC. Request final plot approval of West Center Commons, a subdivision located outside the city limits with rezoning from AG to MU. This was laid over from our July meeting. The location, southeast of 204th Street and West Center Road. May we hear from the city? Sure. The applicant has uh, requested a layover. I anticipate this to be back on the agenda next month, but um, therefore we are recommending layover. Okay. Any questions or comments? Do we have a motion? Move to uh, layover. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you please record the vote? Moore? Yes. Pate? Yes. Morris? Yes. Magan? Yes. Rosecker? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Carries uh, Agenda, uh, moving on, agenda item number two, KC 10-14-104, C 12-14-105. Applicant, Anchor Point Development, LLC, request final plat approval of Anchor Point lots 217 through 302 and out lots P through T, a subdivision outside the city limits with rezoning from AG to R4. Location, northwest of Ida Streets and HWS Cleveland Boulevard. May we hear from the city. This is the fourth phase of Anchor Point Development. Um, it includes 86 single-family residential lots and five out lots, along with the rezoning from AG to R4. Uh, the department recommends approval of the rezoning from AG to R4. 
approval of the final plat subject to the conditions of the revised preliminary plat approval relative to this phase of development and submittal of an acceptable final subdivision agreement. Any questions or comments? Do we have a motion? We get to it. Uh, rezoning from AG to R4, approval of the final plat subject to the conditions of the revised preliminary plat approval relative to the, this phase of the development and submittal of an acceptable final subdivision agreement. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote? Yes. Moore? Yes. Pate? Yes. Morris? Yes. Magan? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Approved. Agenda item number four, KC3-18-27, Applicant Planning Department, on behalf of the City of Omaha, request approval of an amendment to the landmark building TIF redevelopment project plan. Location northeast of 13th and Harney Streets. Bridget, may we hear from you, please? Good afternoon. Um, Bridget Hadley, City Planning. So before you is an amendment to the landmark building uh, TIF redevelopment project plan that was previously approved by the Planning Board March 7th and then subsequently approved by the City Council on April 17th. And the plan originally proposed to convert um, a few of the office floors in this, this building, the landmark building, to a hotel and a boutique type hotel. So that's the primary um, or the original plan. The amendment is simply to substitute a financing source. Um, part of the original sources for this project was new market tax credits. And those uh, credits were not able to be secured for this project. So the developer um, is now requesting the occupation tax be the funding source that is substituted. Um, that particular funding source um, does require the city of Omaha as the redevelopment authority to uh, designate the area for the project as an enhanced employment area and then um, approve that particular occupation tax. The um, community development law also requires us to bring this project back to you as an amendment to that TIF redevelop redevelopment project plan. So there are no changes to the land use, to the zoning. The project still complies with the master plan. This is simply a substitution of a financing source. If you have any questions, I will do my best to answer. Um, we do here have the development team, or David Levy, who is the attorney representing uh, the developer, here to answer any questions. I, I, I do have just a couple of questions still related to the alternative funding source, the occupation tax, um, as part of the financing on it. I understand that the revenues from that will be paid for by the people that stay there and the residents there. Um, However, what happens in the event that there's a shortfall in the revenues collected, um, the sources of those revenues, and the amount of money that they plan to use for part of the financing? What if there's a shortfall? I know okay. there's a bond that's going to be issued, and then maybe that's it's irrelevant right. because there's a bond issued for that. But. Right, right. Uh, but the sources are, well, and, and you did ask at the pre-planning, and I'll touch on that, but I think I will defer that answer to David Levy. But the sources, um, we do have an... Um, um, we do have an enhanced employment occupation tax application that the city has received and the committee has voted on to approve. But the sources of that uh, occupation tax will be a tax on the, the room revenue, um, east retail revenue, so like the gift shop area, um, parking revenue, and then office square footage. So that's where the, the occupation tax revenue will come from. But if there's a shortfall, how will the project handle that? I will defer yeah, that. Yeah, because I assume the revenues generated from those activities would be used to repay the bond. Correct. Right. They would. And so if those revenues come up short, I guess is my question, how, how is the bond going to get repaid then? Yeah. I will defer that to David Levy to answer that question. Okay. See you. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other proponents that wish to speak? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, David Levy, Barrett Home Law Firm, 1700 Farnham Street, on behalf of the developer, 
uh, here and happy to answer any questions. And I know we have at least one, so maybe I'll start with that one. That'd be if a you'd good like. spot. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. Um, so, like with the TIF project, a occupation tax uh, approval results in in, in a uh, occupation tax agreement. So with the TIP project, you have a redevelopment agreement. Here you would have a very similar agreement. And that agreement and the bond documents that you mentioned put the liability on the developer or redeveloper for any shortfalls. So the, the city is essentially, in, in some sense, the city and the county is a pass-through for the money. But should there be a shortfall, um, the redeveloper is contractually obligated to make up that shortfall. By the same token, should the, the projections come in better than anticipated, the tax would end early. And, and, and in that, I, I assume that that is articulated and conveyed in that agreement then? That's correct. That, that, that That's correct. Okay. Yep. Right. And in those financing documents as well. All right. Thank you. Hey, uh -huh. David, uh, why did they ask for uh, eight eight point seven million on the occupational tax? Uh, and short, the mortgage uh, came down a million dollars rather than ask for 7.7 .7 and leave the mortgage where it was. Sure. The occupation tax results in an income stream over 20 years. If at all, if the projections match exactly, it'd be 20 years. When you have a, a stream of money like that, you have to monetize that today because you need that money today to actually build the project. There's a financing cost associated with monetizing that, that income stream. So that's what's in that. That's the difference between the 7.7 .7 and the 8.7, or the other two numbers that you referred to. It one's 36 million and some. That goes down to 35 million and some. That million dollars is that the difference between the 7.7 .7 and the 8.7. So it, it it's there. It's just in a different line item. You good, Jeff? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Any other proponents that wish to speak? Thank you. Thank you, David. Any o oh, are you a proponent? Well, I'm not a proponent? Any opponents that wish to speak? Okay, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Did he say he's an opponent? No. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought well, are you an opponent? No, sir, I'm not. I was just I wanted to speak on this letter I received from you guys. Okay, seeing no other, no other opponents, I'm going to close the public hearing. Any additional questions or comments from the board? We've heard from Bridget. Do you have anything to add? Um, just the department recommends approval. Okay. A motion for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you please record the vote? Magid? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Moore? Yes. Pate? Yes. Morris? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Approved. Agenda item number five, case C3-18-177, applicant planning department on behalf of the city of Omaha, request approval of amendments to the 2016 and 2017 action plans, location Omaha and the three mile extraterritorial jurisdiction. Uh, good afternoon, Jim Anderson, City Planning Department. Um, the 16 and 17 action plans represent the community development budgets the city uses to uh, make improvements in um, the city of Omaha and in uh, the case of the 17, or excuse me, the 16 in the city of Council Bluffs. Uh, what the 16 plan does is uh, switches funding from um, a multifamily effort, which is uh, going to be completed to a uh, single family um, home ownership uh, assistance. The 17 is uh, a change of focus that the city is undertaking from a location in South Omaha to one in North Omaha. And there are two projects associated with that switch, and uh, both of those will then become. Uh, focused in that area and will also
continue to have a focus until um, the redevelopment effort switches focus. Are there any questions? Any questions of Jim? Okay, thank you, Jim. Any other proponents that wish to speak? Any opponents? Seeing none, close the public hearing. Any additional comments? We've heard from the city. Eric, do you want to? Just recommend approval. Okay. I move for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote? Pate? Yes. Morris? Yes. Maggot? Yes. Rosecker? Yes. Moore? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Approved. Agenda item number six, case C3-18-176, applicant planning department on behalf of the city of Omaha request approval of the 2019 through 2024 capital improvement program. Location, Omaha and the three mile extra territorial jurisdiction. Kevin, do you wanna? Sure, um, so uh, just for the benefit of those in the room who may not know, the. CIP, the Kevin, 19 to 20. Sorry, I have to give your name. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Kevin Carter with the, the planner with the planning Sorry about department. that. <laughs> First time, I guess. Um, so the CIP is the city's six-year program for major infrastructure improvements um, related to streets, sewers, uh, parks, and other public facilities. Um, and it's updated annually. Um, this year's CIP um, has a number of new projects which you have on the list um, in front of you. And um, if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer those. You answered my questions in our pre-meeting, but right. um, you're the one responsible for the format of this year's CIP, and you did a great job. It was, I didn't read all 170 pages. <laughs> But it was easy to go through and pick out things and, and, and check on things. It was good. Thank you. You did, Jeff. <laughs> if you have any ideas for other more improvements, I'm happy to hear them, too. So. Okay. Any additional questions or comments for Kevin? Okay. Any other proponents? Any opponents? Oh, come on down. Need name and address, please. Sure. I am Sarah Shirley, uh, CEO of Livewell Omaha. My personal address is 4540 William Street, Omaha, Nebraska 68106. Good afternoon, Chairman and Board. Thank you for taking my comments. I'm actually entering neutral testimony, neither a proponent or opponent. Um, just wanted to go on record with a comment related to the CIP. Uh, we, uh, Livewell Omaha, is a community health coalition of more than 47 organizations that all join together because they prioritize health. Um, and the city has been a very strong partner, as they will continue to be in the future. For 15 years, one of our big priorities has been something called the Bike Omaha Network, which the vision was to create a 20-mile bike space uh, for people to ride safely. It's not just about biking. It's about safe communities where people bike, people can walk, people slow down in the neighborhoods, and then there aren't those incidences that we don't want to see. Uh, so today, I just wanted to comment on one piece that was removed from the CIP plan this year, which was Leavenworth 31st to 39th. It's a piece that uh, we've leveraged quite a bit of philanthropic dollars and lots and lots of time and energy from area neighborhood associations to rally and say that a road diet could be possible there with the inclusion of bike lanes, which then would slow the traffic and create a feeling of safety along that Leavenworth corridor. Furthermore, now that the South Omaha Trail is open, it would open a gateway then to all the traffic that we know is coming from that trail, as well as it's really the only straight shot for folks to bike specifically to connect to downtown. Um, so I, I just wanted to raise that. We continue to be a strong partner of the city. We're continuing to uh, work with the city to uh, do a wayfinding <coughs> network of signs throughout the entire bike network, and that work will continue. It's going quite well. Uh, but wanted to be on record that we are disappointed that that is not included. Also wanted to comment that I agree the communication of the CIP um, as a health advocacy coalition, we're actually able to understand more of that and be able to weigh in and have the opportunity for public comment. And that's certainly what government is all about. And so I commend the city for uh, that next iteration of how that's communicated. Thank you. And when you talk about 30th to 39th and Leavenworth, are you talking about having designated bike lane? So painted white. How do you how do you reconcile the 
there's a lot of development that's happening, and most of that, I think you'll agree with me that most of the properties on both sides of Leavenworth are in developers' hands to build up or to re remodel, and, and there's, there's going to be a lot more traffic, I think, along that Leavenworth corridor. Doesn't that concern you about putting the bikes where where all that traffic is? How do you, do they play well together when you have a bike lane? So I'm not an engineer, I want to say that. Neither am I. <laughs> Um, but we've collaborated with lots of engineers. We've collaborated uh, for a number of years now with Tool Design Group um, and with the City of Omaha Public Works and Planning. And there was a private um, traffic study done with philanthropic money that told us that actually we could retain, I believe, I'm not, I don't want to go on record actually because I can't remember, but it was a very uh, healthy flow of traffic through that corridor of Leavenworth, still with the inclusion of road diet and bike lanes. Furthermore, there's a lot of safety data to say that if you have two lanes of traffic with a middle turn lane, which is how the cross section was laid out, it actually increases the safety, increases the movement of traffic because you're not having that, I'm crossing against two lanes of traffic and not seeing oncoming vehicles. So actually, as urban communities grow up, um, that's where people want to be. They don't want to be where people are zooming through and not spending money. They want to be in a place where they can cruise by and have a cup of coffee and jump into these developments and actually spend money, spend dollars. Um, and neighborhoods and their property values also don't want to see people just fly by either. And so um, that's, that's where we're coming at it. We, we do actually feel like it would be in the interest of safety of the neighborhood to continue with the project. Stay on them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any opponents that wish to speak? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Um, Eric, did you want to address? I just want to touch on the fact that, you know, it's an exhaustive process involving many different, all the departments of the city and the mayor's office in preparing this document. Um, you know, a lot of work goes into many months of work and um, the planning board's specific role is to review the proposed capital improvement program for compliance with the master plan, and we believe it does that and recommend approval. Okay. I move approval of the 2019-24 capital improvement program. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote? Morris? Yes. Magan? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Moore? Yes. Mr. Pate? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Approved. Okay, moving on. Agenda item number seven, case C8-18-140, C10-18-141, C12-18-161, applicant Sean Negus, request preliminary and final plat approval of Peaceful Oaks, a minor plat outside the city limits with rezoning from DR to R1, and approval of a special use permit to, a, to allow development in the northern in the North Hills Environmental Resources Overlay District. Property is located within an ED Environmental Resources Overlay District. Location north of North Crest Drive and west of North Post Road. May we hear from the applicant, please? Sean Negus, 11828 North 34th Avenue. Um, <clears throat> So I'm asking for uh, the board to approve the final plat for this. I know it's been recommended to be laid over. Um, we've, uh, I've done all the due diligence required by the city to, to get this thing moved through, um, and I'd really like to not push it back another month. Um, I, you know, I went to the pre-planning meeting, got everything that I needed to do, hired the engineer, uh, to submit everything to the city for the plat. Um, there's only one document that hasn't came through, and that is a document from the NDEQ approving that for the septic system on the property. Um, I would ask that if it was possible to approve the final plat and that permits were not issued until that letter and documentation of approval was received by the city. Um, that's really all I'm asking for. Is it a brick residence? Uh, it is not. It's actually for uh, my aunt and uncle. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Okay. 
Any other proponents? Are there any opponents that wish to speak? Bernice Pfeiffer, 7806 South 98th Street in La Vista. I am the past president of the Northern Hills Overlay, and I specifically came down for the other project also. But in this case, too, um, I hope that you will really consider that the DR, which we worked on for so long, approved by the City Planning Board and the City Council in years back, um, do require a minimum of one acre lots. Thank you. Okay. Any other <coughs> opponents that wish to speak? Did you wish to speak, ma'am? No? Okay. All right, that's okay. <laughs> All right, we're going to close the public hearing. Any comments or questions from the board? <coughs> you want to address the concerns uh, or the request of Sean? Sure. Thank you. Eric. Yeah, so this site is approximately a little bit over 30,000 square feet, not quite three quarters of an acre. Um, therefore, the rezoning from DR to R1, uh, you do need a minimum of one acre to have a lot in the DR district. Um, you need a minimum of 20,000 square feet for the R1 district. Uh, this area is, is programmed for low density residential. Um, therefore, the city is comfortable with, with recommending approval of the rezoning to the R1 to allow um, the construction of the single family home. Anytime there is a septic system involved, um, the Nebraska Department of Environmental Quality requires pre-approval when a lot created is less than three acres in size. Um, therefore, it's the city's policy that we do not recommend in support of final plats until we have that written correspondence from that state department indicating that the lot is of sufficient size and um, you know characteristics to be able to support their requirements for the septic system which is their review um, you know it, this is about as, as small of a lot that I've seen for a request for a septic system so as a city, we are definitely not comfortable in, in pushing off or recommending in support of the final plat at this time and, you know, just holding up building permits. We're not comfortable with that because we want to make sure that the, the lot is of sufficient size that it can support the single family home and, and the septic system that's required for that. Um, that being said, um, you know, we are in support of the rezoning, the special use permit and the preliminary plat, but at this time, we would recommend layover for the final plat to allow that information to come in. Whenever we get that information in, we're able to put the final plat back on the planning board agenda. Um, so really that's, um, we leave that in the, the developer, the applicant's hands to be able to get that submission to the state to be able to get that letter of approval. From, from experience, I think the EQ letter, are, are they on time or are they behind or, or is there something that needs to be provided by the applicant or by the department to get that letter? There is an application that the applicant would have to make to that specific state department with the state of Nebraska. Um, I've heard it's maybe a four week time frame. I, I don't know if that's accurate or not. I've never applied or had much correspondence. Sean, can you with come them. back up? Address, please. Yep. Sean Negus, 11828 North 34th Avenue. Um, so, all the engineering has been done. Essentially, all we're waiting for is a letter of approval. It meets all criteria for the parameters that they're asking for. Um, they have a new staff member that approves these. And generally speaking, it's a four-week time frame turnaround, but right now it's six to eight weeks is, uh, is what um, TD2 is telling me. Thompson, Dreesen, Dorner, my engineer. So, so your so, engineer has already made requested for that uh, letter? Yep, and, and also has asked them to try to push this up as for it's going to hold us up. But the, what the response is, that he was going to try to move it up on the list of priorities and get stuff done within the next week, but couldn't guarantee it because he is an, essentially a, new, a newer member of their staff. So, when um, was that request submitted? Uh, it was, I think, 30 days ago is when actually they, they submitted all that to them. I, I don't know that date exactly, but everything was done in a timely manner, and this is the only thing that's that's holding us up. 
So you're so. you're saying that all of the other conditions here that have been outlined in in the city's recommendations have been addressed. Everything. Other than the other than the letter that uh, we need from Andy. And that's that's all it is. It meets all the, the percolation requirements. It has the square footage needed to do it. I mean, the science part of it is done. All we need is that letter. So, I mean, it's it's kind of, you know, ridiculous to leave this thing hang over a whole nother month. And then then I'll have to submit for permits, you know, plans and, and stuff after that for permits um, just over essentially a approval letter from the NDEQ. Eric, I understand that this is the layover. Um, as far as you know, is this the only item outstanding? Um, no, just looking, and I'll give our official recommendation here shortly, but, um, you know, there are six conditions that we're recommending approval of the preliminary plat. Um, some of that would be a revised grading plan, a revised tree canopy analysis, um, there's going to be a subdivision agreement that will be needed. So, so I the believe... The hasn't seen those items yet? No. And oftentimes, the creation of those subdivision agreements do take some time. I believe that if, if we move forward with the rezoning special use permit preliminary plat, lay over the final, the applicants can still work on many of those items. I don't believe it'd be ready to go down to city council by the time that the final plat could be heard next month if, if it's able to get that approval letter from the NDEQ. So... Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, if there's no other comments or questions, Eric, can we hear the, yep. from the city's So the official recommendation is approval of the rezoning from DR to R1, approval of the special use permit to allow development in the North Hills Environmental Resources Overlay District, approval of the preliminary plat subject to the six conditions listed in the recommendation report, and lay over the final plat to allow, well, why don't I leave those approvals, vote on those, and then... I would recommend layover in a separate motion. Okay. Do we have a motion? I move for approval of the rezoning from DR to R1, approval of the special use permit to allow development in the North Hills Environmental Resources Overlays di District, and approval of the preliminary plat subject to the six conditions outlined in the city's Second. recommendations. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Maggot? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Moore? Yes. Pate? Yes. Morris? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Approved. Okay, do we have a motion on the NDEQ approval? The, well, the department recommends layover the final plat to allow submittal of NDEQ approval and to address conditions of the preliminary plat. Okay. Move layover, layover of the final plat to allow submittal of the NDEQ approval and to address <coughs> conditions of the preliminary plat. Second. We don't need it for the time for when I do it. No, the applicant can continue to work with us. We have a new deadline submittal next week. If, if they have some correspondence from the NDQ, they can reach out to us and, and we're able to get the final plat back on the agenda in a timely manner. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Rosehacker? Yes. Moore? Yes. Pate? Yes. Morris? Yes. Magid? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Approved? I think we can move up to agenda item number 13. Case C10-18-169, applicant Melissa Brady. Request rezoning from DR and R1 to R1. Property is located within an ED environmental resources overlay district. Location 13126 North 42nd Street. May we hear from the applicant, please? Jack Brady, uh, 131, or 13126 North 42nd Street. Um, we're just looking to rezone from the DR to the R1 to be able to combine our home, which is on R1 and connected. Um, the DR zone is landlocked, not accessible, accessible anywhere but our house, and just looking to combine the lots to ease the selling process at a future date. Selling two lots separate requires two separate banknotes. It's complicated and we're not planning on doing any remodeling or changing of the environment back there it's currently used as horse pasture and will be continued to use as such 
and if, if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Any other proponents that wish to speak? Any opponents that wish to speak? Chairman and board members, Dorothy Poland, 130 North 47th Street, Omaha, Nebraska. I oppose this, and if I had information about the prior one, I would have opposed that also. There's a large concern among the members of that our community in Ponca Hills that Ponca Hills remains a natural native area that is inclusive of the over, Northern Hills overlay, and the changing of DRs to R1s is very concerning because then we create a higher dense population which we do not have an infrastructure to support. Um, along with septic, when we ha had our acreage, we had to have our, a redesigned plan through an engineering consulting firm to have an alternative septic field also, so I think that's something to take into consideration. But why I'm concerned is I don't want to see R1s go to DR. When you add those two properties together, it would meet DR requirements. The other thing is I don't want set, also part of this is setting a precedence, opening Pandora's box for DRs to become R1, and Ponca Hills is kind of a diverse terrain. It, it, it includes the lowest hills, which are only seen in Iowa and in China. We don't want to disrupt that, the tree canopy, those kind of things. We also don't have infrastructure to support additional homes. I understand they want to go just pasture land of the house, but I'd like to see it stay DR. Um, I also, when you look at the DCGIS mapping through your site, it will show you very clearly it is a DR or greater size acreage population in Ponca Hills, so we'd like that to stay the same way. Also, I want to thank uh, Mr. Salmonson for help in finding documents. But one of the things, a couple things I have concerns with. The email was not correct on the letter, so I don't know how many people emailed and their emails didn't get here. I had sent a couple before I ever got it right. Also, 300 feet when you're talking acreages, that's not very many people that are gonna know about what's happening in our neighborhood. Our neighborhood isn't my neighbor sitting 50 feet away from me. So I have that concern. I also, when you read the document of DR, it says it assures land is not developed prematurely and without adequate urban service. We don't have any infrastructure really. I'm on a septic system. I do not have city water. I live across the street from this property. I, that's another reason. When you go to R1, it says single family dwellings on large lots with supporting community facilities. What's the community facility? I don't see any out there. So I don't think we're meeting the guidelines of that. So also, one of the things on the overlay is, it says native prairies, unplowed land dominated by native grasses and herbaceous plants. So we don't wanna see these grasslands changed. We want them to remain native. I happen to live on a uh, ravine, diverse terrain lot, that is totally with tree canopy. I try real hard to not let invasive plants get into the forest because where can we say, this is truly Nebraska. And that's what I want Ponca Hills to say. So thank you very much for listening to my concerns and I hope you very seriously consider keeping the total property DR. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Any other opponents that wish to speak? Um, Bernice Pfeiffer, 7806 South 98th Street, uh, La Vista. Um, I have been active out in the Ponca Hills until I followed my job, and I had to move south, unfortunately. Um, but I was past president of the Ponca Hills Neighborhood Association. I worked with the city uh, planning department to create this overlay district to protect all of the beautiful, luscious Ponca Hills area, which includes Neil Woods, the Hummel Park, um, Dodge Park, all of those areas where people love to bike and to 
drive out on a Sunday to enjoy the serenity of that area. I know Omaha is very concerned about having the environment protected, and we do appreciate all of the work that the planning department previously had done to help us uh, with our concerns. Um, DR allows for low density, um, and that is the minimum of one acre lots. And I'm hoping that in all of these uh, cases that come before you, that you really do consider the minimum as one acre lots. Uh, we worked really hard to allow residents to put up single family homes but with a minimum of one acre because of the lack of water. I mean, most, most of the acreages are over one acre. Um, but the water, the well water, uh, we cannot deplete that well water for those already that have it. Uh, the waste, as uh, Dorothy mentioned, is very concerning because you get a high density with septic tanks and the waste um, is of great concern. It also says in the, the um, developmental or overlay section 5590 is to the disturbance of sensitive and unique features. Uh, this is what a part, uh, if you know the Ponca Hills, you realize that this is an important feature of the Ponca Hills area. Um, and we're very happy that this North Hills overlay um, says that no removal may be of soil or disturbance of any vegetation or on within 50 feet of any land that contains uh, perennial streams or like Shipley Creek intermittent streams out there it cannot come within 50 feet of those, cannot come within 50 feet of the native prairie grasses, which a lot of land out there is undisturbed and does contain the native prairie lands. And the water again, the well water is not adequate uh, if you put in a high density level of homes, will be very inadequate. And in particular, this case is adding on pasture land. Uh, please keep it as DR so that in the future, anyone else uh, needs to go through to be uh, scrutinized for the minimum one acre. Do not allow it to become R1. Otherwise, at the future of Ponca Hills uh, may be entirely uh, ruined the whole atmosphere. And the city of Omaha benefits from this because we do out there have all these trees, all of this uh, native grass activity that for bikers and so forth. And we provide a lot of clean air for Omaha. Get rid of some of your, uh, all the air that is displaced by all the cars and things. And all of the clean water, the hills that protect and um, take out all of the waste from the hills. Keep this property, please, as DR, in compatibility with the neighborhood larger sections of the land. Uh, thank you so much, and if you have any questions, I'm willing to answer them. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Bernice. Any other opponents that wish to speak? Ann McGuire, 14910 Shangaska Road. I'm in the Ponca Hills area. And I just want to reinforce and kind of bring up too, one of the wonderful things about Ponca Hills is that it's a big horse community. There are two large stables located on the same road as the um, property that we're talking about, each boarding about um, between 40 and 60 horses. And um, a lot of us ride our horses on those roads. Um, there's signs on the roads um, that there's horses, um, just look out for horses. And 
I am really concerned as we get more and more dense um, that it's going to take away from our ability to really enjoy our community and the uniqueness of it. And um, one additional thing is I'm also concerned about fire protection as we get more dense because we're just served by the volunteer fire department there in Ponca. And um, I want to make sure that everybody feels safe and that we're not getting overpopulated. Thank you. And j just a second, if you would, please. Sure. Um, everybody wants to leave this DR, but this is on the west side of 42nd Street. Right. Aren't all the other lots on that side R1 now? I don't believe so. I, I don't. Think. I don't really know. I do know. Okay, on Forty Second Street, on the left hand side is the riding center, and there's about fifty horses stabled there with an indoor arena, and they'll go down the road to get on the trails. And on the right hand side, at the end of Forty Second Street, is Ponca Hills Farm, where I board my horse, and um, there are, um, I think, there's sixty seven horses at that facility okay. and many of the riders will ride down the road there right. i i thought you might know it, it, just asking if you knew that those were r1 I th i'll let the city address that but okay thanks okay thank you ann any other opponents that wish to speak seeing none i'm going to close the public hearing any additional information comments questions from the board i clearly understand from eric and the planning department about it's it's R1 and, and I understand this issue about financing and the split zoning and stuff but if it all becomes what he's advocating is all become one lot right and at R1 he can only build one house on that and there's already an existing house so if it became if we agreed to approve his request it's not like he can go build apartments back there I mean what can he do without having to come back to the, the city and getting further approvals. Because I, I, I think that their concerns may not be without merit under the, under the R1 zoning. Yeah, there's perhaps <clears throat> maybe a little bit of confusion about what the request is. Um, the applicant's home is currently on 42nd Street, has R1 zoning, just as six or seven other adjacent properties along the west side of 42nd Street are zoned. Those are zoned R1. Um, in this area, there is a lot of property that is zoned DR, but all of it is within the environmental overlay district. This rezoning request would not impact or remove that overlay requirement or any requirements that go with that environmental overlay. Okay. So with so, a bigger lot, he can't go build a, a guest house behind him? No. No, absolutely not. Um, the applicant met with the city. They wanted to combine all this property into to one platted lot. In order to do that, we cannot approve a plat that has split zoning. So we said you need to consolidate the zoning. Uh, they were directed, you know, R1 zoning is fine. DR zoning is probably fine as well. Um, I mean, I think it's important to note that, you know, the minimum size requirements doesn't come into play with this request. I mean, this, this site with these two parcels is over four acres. You know, whereas the current home, I don't know the size, but it's, you know, maybe half an acre. I don't know, you know. Um, so that's not really applicable because um, it's clearly meeting the size requirements for either district. Um, so I mentioned the overlay requirements are not changing. In fact, there would be a note on the plat that they would have to comply with those. Um, our, the state, state of Nebraska requires uh, rezoning requests for the city to notify property owners within 300 feet. Uh, so that is what we do, just to, to comment on Dorothy's comment a little bit. You know, I mean, that being said, I don't know if there would be any impact if we zoned it DR rather than R1. Uh, just comparing the setbacks between the two, they're, they're very similar. I think only the building and impervious coverages are a slight difference between the two. But otherwise, there's no difference. Um, yes, if, if somebody wanted to build another home or anything else as far as more residential units, that would be a completely different process and not what is before the board. 
would that apply to future owners of that property if he sold that property? If so, would, if he if if the owner of the property now sold that property, yes, would any future landowner of that property be able to build or expand on that property going for, forward for more residential yeah. units or something? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean that that would apply to anybody. The difficulty is that back portion; it doesn't have any street frontage. That back portion it, it does not front Forty Seventh Street, so. When you talk about developing other lots or building new residences, you're getting into the whole subdivision process, you know, streets, you know, how, how do they have access? Well, we can't just create a landlocked street. So it, it, to me, I don't see a feasible way at this time if somebody wanted to split this up into multiple lots. I mean, that the, is, that is very opposition. challenging and would include you know, a much larger process through planning board. And Wouldn't the opposition be better off having him have one lot? Because right now he has two lots. So if he, he wanted... He has two parcels. Two parcels. But if he wanted to, to say, provide an easement to the back and sell the back and let someone build a house back there... We wouldn't allow it because well, I, it, I has to be a, it has to be a platted lot, okay. which is what they're going to do because they, their front portion is already a platted lot. The landlocked parcel is unplatted ground. Okay. Mm. But if it was... But if, but if it's all one, what he's going to do is plat one lot, right? He's combining his platted lot with the unplatted ground into one lot. And, and he the, has one house already. There's no more residences. And on our lot. one zoning, you can only have one yep. house per lot. Yep. All right. So I, I, I think I'm going to, I think I, well, we're okay. With you know, I, and, and that being said, I mean, the applicant is just following the advice of the city to yeah. rezone yeah. R1. I'm good. Now, whether, whether, you know, to ease the neighbor's concerns... I don't think the applicant would have any concerns with with DR zoning either, you know. So, Jack, do you want to come up? Come back up, please. State your name and address again. Uh, Jack Brady, one three one two six North Forty Second Street. Eric just made the point about doesn't wouldn't think you would have any problems with going to DR or staying R one. You just took the advice of the city correct that is correct we came to the city board asking for advice on how to combine our lots and asked him the proper and best way to move forward on that um, he advised the r1 just because as you stated all the houses along that road are already r1 so we just went along that route didn't really explore the option of going to dr didn't really know that was an option okay. i think that Something else, and just I think from a practical sense, needs to be stated for those of you that are concerned. If you look at that, the way this property would lay out as one lot, that entire panhandle section of it, the access where your house sits now that's zoned R1 already, would be ultimately consumed by a road to get back in there. And then you'd have that terrain back there to try to negotiate any more houses in. It's just, it's unlikely anybody would ever attempt that. And the, the criteria that they'd have to go through with the subdivision to be able to do that, it's, just, it's never going to happen. Yeah. And so literally <coughs> every, every lot along there is already R1. And so you're, you're really, actually you're making it consistent with everything else from my perspective. So. And my understanding from the pre-meeting was, was if we change it to all DR, then that makes his house non-conforming, non correct? Non-conforming. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. At further analysis, um, that was not accurate. The setbacks are the same in DR and R1. Really? Yeah. So everything would be the same between R1 and DR. The only noticeable R1 difference of the regulations him. is there's a s slight increase of allowed building and impervious coverage in R1 compared to DR. But with this being a four acre lot, I don't envision that ever being an issue. I'd like to make the. Uh, well, I have given our. Trent, just a second. Uh, um, Jack, you can take a seat. Thank, Thank you, you for coming up. Thanks, Jack. Um, uh, it looks to me like the city made the recommendation with a purpose, and that is just what Patrick was saying. If uh, if we left that as a if we changed it to all DR, then it would be not compliant with the additional with the existing zoning surrounding. Correct. I want to make sure we got that correct. I don't believe that going to DR would create any non-conforming situation, but that's, you know, just my best analysis. Yeah. So okay. it, 
here as the city, I'll make a recommendation as the report states to approve the rezoning to R1. If the board decides to deny that and go to DR instead, I don't think that's an issue. But the department recommends approval to R1. We make a motion to, to approve as R1. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Moore? Yes. Pate? Yes. Morris? Yes. Maggot? Yes. Rosecker? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Approved. Agenda item number 14, KC 10 18 170. Applicant John Stallnacker request rezoning from GI to R7. Location, 1103 South 22nd Street. May we hear from the applicant or the applicant's representative? Good afternoon. My name is John Stolliker. My address is 3227 Harney Street. And I am requesting uh, rezoning from uh, GI. And actually it says R7, but... I see the board recommended R5, and that's more appropriate. That's it. Okay. Any questions? Any other proponents that wish to speak? Any opponents? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. And we hear from the city. Sure. This rezoning request is before us because residential uses are not allowed <coughs> in the industrial zoning district, as you're aware. Um, the future land use map for this area indicates low density residential. So the request came in, it mentioned rezoning to R7. Um, we're definitely supportive of rezoning to residential, uh, but we believe that R5 is a better fit. So we are recommending denial of the rezoning to R7, approval of the rezoning to R5. One, or two votes. One motion. I motion for denial of rezoning to R7 and approval of rezoning to R5. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote? Pate? Yes. Morris? Yes. Maggot? Yes. Rosecker? Yes. Moore? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Approved. Agenda item number 16, case C10-83-146, applicant, Security National Bank, Request approval of a major amendment to a MD major development overlay district, one Pacific place, location 1120 South 101st Street. May we hear from the applicant, please? <clears throat> yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the planning board, and planning staff. My name is Todd Swarzak with Not All Companies at 2285 South 67th Street. Our proposal for the uh, project would be a second building to the south of Security National Bank at 1120 South 101st Street. Um, we are requesting a maximum size of the square foot building at 83,500 square feet, which would actually be about 67,700 square feet of office. We have some residential potentially on the top floor and some internal parking on the ground floor. Uh, we are also proposing what was previously a 360 stall garage, but it, after further uh, engineering study, it's been up to about 373 stall parking garage. Um, and we are not proposing to change any of the curb cuts or the access to the site. Uh, the reason that we're here is because there is a 1985 development agreement uh, for the entire um, site and the surrounding parcels. And we are looking to change that in three separate uh, ways. The first way is we are requesting to have a residential that was not anticipated in 1985 for this site. It'll be a small number of units. There'll be luxury apartment units. Uh, we're <coughs> thinking three to seven in that range, probably about five uh, units. Um, <clears throat> maybe for the Landon family, the owners of Security National Bank. Uh, the second request is the FAR, the floor area ratio for this particular lot is 0.55. Uh, we're requesting that that be 
up to 0.7 uh, for the office structures on this lot. And then the third request <clears throat> would be for the overall increase for the entire development of the office square footage from 390,000 to 441,360 square feet. Um, I'd like to take a second to talk about those changes and uh, each one. The residential is fairly self-explanatory. It's a GO zone district that requires normally a conditional use permit, but since this is a major amendment, this, the residential has been rolled into the request here. Uh, the second, the FAR change, um, we are <clears throat> still under what the original agreement allowed for office on this site. So the original agreement allowed for 190,000 square feet of office on this lot. Uh, with our request, the total square footage of office would be about 165,600. So we are under that original amount. Um, which is why I don't believe there was any need for a traffic study. Public Works did not signal that. We had a traffic study done in 2010 internally, Lamp Rynearson, that indicated that increasing the building to this size, actually the building at that traffic study was a little bit larger, the proposed, uh, would still uh, maintain a level of service of A for the intersection of 101st and Pacific. Um, the third issue is the overall increase in office to 441,000 square feet, and that's for the entire development. What was allowed before was 390,000 square feet. Um, that is um, under the total allowed office and parking structure requirement from 1985, it was 948,000, and we are still only at 896, so we're still under the total, total buildable square footage for the entire development. Um, so currently the structure is parked to code, to the planning department's code, which is one uh, stall for every 300 square feet in office. Uh, we're parked right now at about 3.5, <clears throat> the new project will be parked at about 3.5 per thousand, uh, which is over the, park, the planning department's requirement. Um, we think this is adequate for a Class A office space in this area. Generally, we try to get our clients to move down from sometimes they're around five, five to one for, for an office requirement not the planning department, just the market. However, we are always pushing our clients to go lower. Um, and this client understands that this, this would work for their needs. So we are still meeting the parking requirement of the planning department. We're over it, in fact, a little bit. <clears throat> so we think that based on our experience with Exarban Village, uh, we're generally parking Per gross square foot there, we're parking at about three to three and a half, so we're above that with this development. Um, and the owners, the Landon family, are, um, are fine with that. They want to move forward with that. Uh, we think that there's been some uh, issue uh, about parking on 101st Street. Uh, we think that could potentially be an operational issue regarding a no smoking campus that some people do park in their cars along the street to be off the campus. It's a public street uh, and smoke in their cars. Additionally, we've noticed that on Saturdays, the 101st Street still has car parking when the office structures are closed. Um, I can only speculate that that is potentially because one Pacific Place Park is to the south and there is a very popular bike trail and the park is used and there's not a lot of parking surrounding that park. Um, so people could be parking on the street. Uh, that is speculation, but it would explain a little bit why this, there is still street parking there on Saturdays. Um, our company, Noddle Companies, uh, have reached out to all of the adjacent property owners, including the Wantanabe family. Uh, we've reached out to Northern Natural Gas 
um, and spoken with these people as well. Um, we've reached out to the local representation for the Coley Jessen building. Um, I have reached out personally to the Regency Homeowners Association and the Regency Townhouse Association. Neither of two, those two organizations felt that it was necessary for us to present at their monthly meeting. They didn't see any concern with the project. Uh, Ted Zetzman, our executive vice president, has reached out and spoken with members of uh, ownership at Broadmoor on three separate occasions. They've had conversations. Um, so to conclude, I think we would say that um, the next step in our process, um, hopefully with an approval here, would be to move on to city council. And we also need to present this to the actual architectural committee of the Pacific Shores um, Owners Association, which has not reviewed a case in a number of years, but we've uh, been reaching out to bring them together, and that would be the next step on our part. Uh, we think the project is exactly in line with the goals of Omaha as far as redevelopment of sites, and uh, considering this somewhat of an infill site, um, it's becoming more and more of a walkable area. There is a, quite a bit of retail around. Uh, we believe that the um, office would supply more customers for that retail, and we'd also envision that there would be more tenants for the adjacent apartments with the uh, retail where people could actually walk to, the, uh, to their jobs from where they live and recreate and um, with that, I would open it up to any questions. Thank you. Todd, I'm very supportive of the project. I think it's great for that area. Just add, just one question on a comment that you made. You said you had conversations with the Broadmoor group, or someone from your firm did, but you didn't say what the results of those conversations were. Can you tell us how those? Uh, sure. So Ted Zetzman, our executive vice president, has had multiple conversations with, I believe, uh, Howard and Bob Stratton, the construction manager. Uh, from my understanding, uh, the conversations were that they were a little bit concerned about the parking on 101st Street, which is a public street. Um, we did not see that um, after repeated conversations. We're not sure how that, how we can mitigate their concerns about that. Um, we're still willing to keep talking, but I, I think that uh, we would like to move forward with the project. Yeah, I've been there several times for different functions, and the surface parking lot that exists already is half full, but yet they're still parking on the street there. So I'm not sure what they're parking on the street for, as you alluded to. So it does occur. I'm just not sure why they're parking in the street. Again, I, th I think that it would be maybe a combination between smokers, perhaps, but then that would only be during the work week. So the weekends and the evening parking on the street, ha to me, seems very logical that it's somehow tied in to the use of the trail to the south and the park to the south, since there is not really parking down there. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Any other proponents that wish to speak? Are... Rich Onkin, uh, 1715 South 94th Street. Um, I probably, if you recognized me, you probably thought I would speak in opposition to this because I was so strongly against the uh, Air Arbor Woods. Uh, Development um, overall, uh, I look to the city to be, uh, you know, maintain your principles and stay with your principles. I look to myself to also maintain and stay with my principles. Uh, this is a previously developed site, Arbor Woods uh, development proposed by NB Dodge was not a previously developed site. Uh, this is a site that's not going to impact traffic in our neighborhood, and so therefore, for those two primary uh, reasons, which is those those reasons that I opposed Arbor Woods. I support this development. I uh, want to see our local businesses and our local retail areas to be uh, supported and viable and get what they need uh, from our neighborhood. So that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Any other proponents? Are there any opponents that wish to speak? 
Danielle, come on up. Good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Danielle Dring. I'm here from Smith Slusky, 8712 West Dodge Road, on behalf of Broadmoor Development and the Broadmoor Apartments at One Pacific Place. Um, you have heard some conversation from the proponents of this matter um, with respect to conversations they had with Broadmoor. I've received information from our clients that the conversations with Broadmoor were perfunctory at best. So perhaps there wasn't enough, enough information communicated to Broadmoor with respect to um, the, this proposed development. Broadmoor still has the concern with respect to parking and the safety issues that will be raised with the additional, um, additional vehicular traffic. Um, I, I sent in a letter to the planning board this morning um, that addresses three different concerns specifically, the first of which does relate to um, the potential for residents to lose some of the parking with, with at least this uh, proposed construction duration. There's been no information communicated to Broadmoor with respect to what SNB or Security National Bank seeks to do during their construction period, whether or not there will be adequate parking on the site, which has been referred to earlier in this, uh, in our session here, as Lot 5 at One Pacific Place. The proponent has correctly identified that there is a major development agreement concerning this property. The major development agreement was in fact signed in 1985. Um, I happen to be of the 1985 vintage, so if I do my math correctly, that's about 33 years ago. Um, certainly the city has changed and this site has changed since then, and there will be a need to, to amend that development agreement. However, this proposal certainly circumvents the proper procedures for doing so. The procedures for amending that development agreement are actually set forth in the development agreement in sections, section nine specifically sets forth that all amendments to this agreement will require approval from the planning director and the city council and by Midlands, who was the property owner and developer at that time, or the successor owners of the real estate described in Exhibit A. Exhibit A to the development agreement encompassed all of One Pacific Place in its entirety. And since then, there have been, I, I believe it was a replat that was done um, a fair number of years ago. There's been no official amendment to this development agreement allowing any applicant or any individual lot owner to seek approval first from the city without <coughs> seeking approval and consent from all of the other lot owners circumvents the way that this development agreement is intended to operate. Um, additionally, uh, the Broadmoor has identified that the, the parking street the parking on the public streets there along 103rd Street and along 101st um, poses a specific safety risk to pedestrians in that issue. I believe um, the proponent identified that there was an in-house traffic study done in about 2010. Um, notably, that internal traffic study was not provided to any of the other lot owners with respect to this on-street parking. Um, and while their proposal may be under the total buildable square footage and floor area square footage for the entirety of one Pacific place, that poses a specific threat to the other property owners. It doesn't allow the other property owners to come to the planning board or to submit proposals to the planning department for any other additional development on their specific lots because there's a cap on this development agreement of 948,000 square feet, which to me, I have to admit, sounds like quite a bit of square feet. When, when you're considering that this proposal brings it up to 896, that leaves roughly 54,000 square feet that's a, able to be built, plus or minus a couple thousand square feet in there. Um, that's, that's concerning because what happens if the retail area comes to the planning department and seeks to add any sort of additional <laughs> square footage for any of their tenants or Trader Joe's seeks to expand or any other, even Coley Jessen um, acquired, I believe, some of the other square footage in their own building 
last year. So what happens if Coley Jessen wants to build on, on their lot? They're certainly going to be restricted by this development agreement as it's currently drafted. And with, with the fact and the consideration that there's been no amendment there too, that would restrict Coley Jessen's ability to use their own property. Um, wh what we're really asking for here and what we want to make clear to the planning board is that the way that the plan has been submitted to the planning department for, for consideration and the planning department, it's our understanding has recommended approval. It, it doesn't take into consideration the other lot owners and it doesn't take into consideration the process and procedures that are required of these property owners to follow in order to do a, a development of this caliber. I believe that the proponent also mentioned that there has not been a neighborhood meeting. Um, at this time, I think what Broadmoor is really looking for is a little bit more insight and a little bit more information on, on how this can be accomplished. I don't think that they're objecting to the quality of the proposed development. I don't think that they're oppositional to additional parking by any stretch of the imagination. But right now, and the way that the commercial property industry has worked, and Broadmoor's a big part of that, um, and Broadmoor's a big part of the multifamily development as well. So Broadmoor has concerns with respect to the total density and, and the parking ratios. What we found from other commercial real estate brokers in the area, I believe an email was sent to you, um, you all this morning with respect to what is actually required for commercial tenants and office tenants. It seems to be anywhere in the range of five parking stalls, a five to one ratio, or, or as high as seven. Um, I know that there are certain office buildings in the Omaha area that don't need or necessitate that much parking, and perhaps this is one of them, but if, if the businesses that are operated out of these office buildings do have regular clients coming in during peak business hours, then that might be a consideration for this planning board that the 409 or the 477 or the 490 spots that might be available here may or may not actually be adequate for the use proposed. The other the other consideration here that I have in before the board. as it pertains to parking, let me see here. It, it's, an, it's an analogy to whether or not this amendment that's being proposed can, can be parodied with a special use permit or with a conditional use permit. Um, whenever a property owner or a tenant for, um, for a property owner wants to seek permission from the planning department for a special use or a conditional use permit, they need to bring the property up to code. And it may be that these 477 parking spots meets code, um, but at, the, at this juncture, it's, it's unclear as to whether or not the the record that the city has kept with respect to one Pacific place is adequate for the development agreement and with respect to the uses for these various commercial tenants, whether it's an office space tenant or a retail tenant that's just across 103rd Street. I, I can give a little bit of an analogy here with the parking question. I know that when I've gone to brunch with friends at wheat fields, it, occasionally it's impossible to find parking in that wheat fields area or within a reasonable walking distance in that shopping center from the popularity of Trader Joe's and the popularity of wheat fields um, on a Saturday or Sunday morning. I have on at least one occasion parked along that boulevard area that's 103rd Street loops around and becomes 101st Street. I know that at one point in time I have made a U-turn around a median there and there's not there's no pedestrian um, markings or cross signals or anything like that in that area that would ensure the safety of the pedestrians. So I know, I know that that's a very big concern as well. I, I think that really addresses all of the concerns that Noddle has. What we're really asking is that the city lay this over for one month in order to give the property owners in one Pacific place the opportunity to meet and at least 
decide whether or not they can amend this development agreement without the uh, consent and approval from all the other property owners. It's just simply seeking approval from the planning board here today circumvents the entire intent of the of the developer and of the various property owners at the time the development agreement was signed. So for those reasons, we would respectfully request that this be laid over and, and that we can reconsider this in September. Danielle, I've got a question for you. I'm listening to, to everything that you said and, and I appreciate the comments, but I'm not sure I understand what Broadmoor's concern is here. I mean, they own the apartment complex, is that correct? That's right. Okay. Does it impact their apartment dwellers in any way? I, had, I hadn't heard any kind of arguments to, to, to that extent that it would. So, so I'm having difficulty understanding what their concern is. So the concern for Broadmoor is really twofold. With respect to the impact on their tenants, the, the parking consideration that's being proposed, um, Broadmoor does not believe it's consistent with with what would be actually required for the use at this lot five in one Pacific place. That would mean that there would be overflow parking, whether it's along 101st Street or 103rd Street, or whether it actually overflows into the apartment's surface area parking spaces. So that that's one concern with respect specifically to the parking proposal here. Now, the second concern that Broadmoor really has is the procedure through with which this has been presented. Um, it, it did circumvent um, approval by all of the property owners, which is required in that development agreement. If, if Noddle and on behalf of Security National Bank and any other representatives on behalf of Security National Bank would be able to or be willing to have a conversation with the representatives from the other lot owners and the other lot owners, I feel like it, it would be possible, if not quite likely, to achieve that approval and then to correct this bad record that has existed since this development agreement was signed. The development agreement contains the meets and bounds descriptions for the real property, but it, it has since, like I mentioned, has since been um, replatted. There's a need to actually have a development agreement that corresponds with these actual parcels and the property owners and the property lines that are owned by these different owners. It, it certainly would serve the city's interest to be able to track this better um, from a perspective standpoint. Does so that, that's, that's, that's another reason that Noddle's here today, or that, that I'm here today. Thank you. Does that development agreement restrict anything uh, as to what the, the, the proposal is here? Yes, there are there are restrictions in the development agreement. They're set forth in sections 2.2. There are subsections to that, um, specifically subsections 2.2.2 and 2.2.5. Um, Which we don't have a copy in front of us, so I'm not sure what those restrictions are. Sure. Um, if I'm happy to give you my copy here. Or you um, just put it on the screen. Put sure. it on the screen if you want. If you don't mind, I've, I've highlighted certain parts of it, and so you may see blue marks on, on this. And while you're, while you're looking for that or, or, or making that, I'll just make a comment on the parking. The 5 to 1 parking ratio, in my estimation, I've been involved in several real estate projects uh, for office space, and this use uh, is not, uh, that, that's, that's, that's high five to one. A three to one is acceptable, and I think for the use that this is, I think a three to one would be more than uh, than adequate parking for, for the use that's proposed for this. So that's just a comment I want to make. This might be more oh, are you doing that? I don't have to disagree with my fellow colleague here. <laughs> I've been for 25 years in office, and if it's three and a half, you know, you'll, you'll see, and especially banks and law firms, and there's a lot of, there's a big law firm there, you know, they've gone from private offices to open space to cubes, and, and this goes for insurance companies' offices, all types of uses at, at One Pacific Place and other office parks. And there is a trend towards uh, consolidation, and, and given the cost and the, the high cost of land and the high cost of construction now, they try to put more people in these spaces. And, and sometimes, it, you know, until we have autonomous cars, which could be 10 years or 20 years or never, um, I would say that, that 
from an office standpoint and a retail standpoint, um, three and a half or four is, is pretty low. I think. Well, if you're if you're including retail, it depends on what kind of retail. We can get into well, this discussion. Well, I think all. Well, you got a mixed use development, but I think this is a uh, this is a large enough development, <coughs> and there's enough concern from some of the the neighbors that I, I think it, to lay this over for a month. And, and I know that Security National Bank is a beautiful conference room. They're a big conference room. They lend it out to neighbors and sports teams and Qantas Club and everything else. If if they would host a meeting and and at least have a conversation for the next couple of weeks. It, it doesn't sound like anybody questions their integrity, their uh, their quality of this development. And I think it's, it's a beautiful project, but uh, Parking and, and traffic is, 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 is an issue, and, and especially if, if one of the other neighbors wants to expand or, or um, the tenant makes changes there. I, I don't I don't think laying this over for 30 days is a is is a horrible thing, and it'll probably lead to a better project. Go ahead. So, Mr. Pate, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of address your question, but I, I want to make sure that there's a full picture of this development agreement. The development agreement is actually on record with the Register of Deeds. It's in Books 472. It begins on page 529. In the in Noddle's proposal, which is, is very professionally done and it looks great, all of, all of the photos that are provided with respect to this development proposal I, I think really meet very well with the aesthetic there and, and with improving the area. Um, one major concern that I had with respect to Noddle's proposal is a reference to what is identified as GSF. I, I believe I can assume that to mean gross square footage um, without kind of making up any wholly unrelated definition for a GSF in their proposal. But I will point out that the development agreement refers to it as a gross building area. Um, then with respect to the specific issues that I was addressing in, in the subsections and in section 2.2, 2.2 really refers to the development plan for all of one Pacific place. And it says in the development plan that unless it's stated otherwise by, by the development agreement, or you know if there's if there's some other city requirement here that the developers and the property owners need to follow this development plan section 2.2 let me center it here section 2.2 says midlands which would have been the developer and the, one of the property owners at that time reserves the right to modify the development plan in any or all of the following ways and who's um, midlands midlands would have been the let me see what the title is on their signature block. Midlands was a development company and a Nebraska general partnership that served as the developer for, um, for One Pacific Place. I believe they acquired some of the land from the estate of Carl W. Renstrom and this is also signed, um, the development agreement is also signed on by the mayor of the city of Omaha and, um, and the assistant city attorney at that time. So Midlands was the developer and the, the developer also was a property owner at that time. At least that's, that's my understanding of the records that I had. So if I pull the title, title work on this, any of the property in this, area would this appear it should appear um, and all or at least some of the property as of February 7th 1985 all or some of the property should have been owned by Midland if, if a full title search is being done I have to admit I received this development agreement I believe it was yesterday or it may have been on Monday so I've, I've had roughly four or five days to work on this. So this has been a pretty whirlwind project for me. Um, the development agreement does allow the property owner or the developer to make certain changes, um, specifically provided that 
any of the modifications do not violate the provisions of the Omaha Municipal Code and that the city agrees that any or all of such modifications shall not be shall not constitute a violation of this section of two point of two point one right above it. Two point two point two was one of the sections I mentioned that the, the this proposal did not follow. It says as long as the site plan the site development regulations are not violated, Midlands may reduce the number of office buildings from three to two. This development agreement does not actually contemplate the addition of any other office buildings. It specifically says from three to two office buildings and it, it doesn't contemplate any more than three. Um, 2.2.5 um, relates to off street parking and it you know, basically says with, with the approval of the planning director um, and the city council, then Midlands may alter some of the design of the off street parking and the location of that. Um, let's see. So long as such alteration does not increase or decrease the paved surface of such parking area by more than 20%. So this is the next page, by more than 20% from that shown on such lot on the development plan. This, this proposal is roughly a 30% increase. Um, I mean, that's, that's a little bit different from what's actually set forth in the development agreement. All right, look, I, thank you. For, you know, really, it'd, it'd be beneficial to have a copy of that to read in its entirety, just to, to, to understand it in its entirety. But I'm going to ask the city probably to provide some comments on, on the development yeah, agreement, how it relates to this as well. Mike, do you want 30 days to look at that? No, no, I don't. I, I, no, I don't need 30 days. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, members. Are there any other opponents that wish to speak? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. Todd, would you like to come up and address some of the issues that Danielle has raised? Uh, Todd Swarzak, Novel Companies, 2285 South 67th Street. A couple of the issues that were brought up. Uh, we are going to meet the city parking requirement. The site, as it exists now, meets the city's parking requirement. Our proposal will meet the city's parking requirement. Uh, so I wanted to clear that up if there was any questions about that. There is no existing board for this development as there may have been in 1985. So without that existing, we have gone property owner to property owner. Yeah. All of the property owners have been neutral or agreed with uh, this project, except for the concerns that Broadmoor has raised, specifically about the parking on 101st Street. Um, as far as any safety issues or anything like that, I would defer to Ryan Haas and Public Works, since it is a public street. Um, we would be open to an idea of limiting parking to two hours at a time or so something like that. Um, I'm not sure that a fourth meeting with the one property owner who is not on board is going to satisfy anything. Um, I know we won't be parking the structure at five or seven to one. It just won't, it won't work. There won't be a building there. Um, and like I had said in the past, we've been trying to drive down our clients' parking requirements based on our experience at Exarban Village. Um, Can you tell us how the, do you know how the construction equipment's going to be staged? Yeah, so at this point, it is a conceptual project. We do not have all of the tenants lined up for the office. Um, that will come at a later phase. Uh, we will work with all of the property owners on the construction. Uh, there will be no spillover parking into the Broadmoor uh, parking lots of their, of their development. <clears throat> I anticipate that there will probably be, for a period of time, some more on-street parking on 103rd and 101st while the construction ramps up. 
um, until we get the garage portion of it done, and that will satisfy a lot of parking requirement there. Um, and then the office will be phased in after that, so uh, presumably that would take care of itself once the garage is, is uh, uh, built. I would also like to state that the, the original agreement, we believe, again, going back to following the procedures, that there were not procedures in place that said you have to meet with them, then them, then them. We are, we are going to meet, we are going to try to pull together after today and during this process an ar a non-existent architectural committee that existed in the past in this property. And we've tried to do that so far by individually reaching out, but we will do that again when we have our elevations farther along, when our building elevations are a little bit farther along. Um, I would also like to state that the development agreement allowed for 190,000 square feet of office on this lot. We are with the new proposal at 166,000. So we're less than what was allowed in the beginning anyway. Um, hopefully that would mitigate some concerns. Um, as far as any redevelopment in the future uh, for additional for adjacent lots, I think that they would have the same right that we have now to bring an amendment forward to the planning board and then to city council on their specific development. Um, we are concerned with this specific development. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the future at one specific place or the adjacent lots. Um, all I can say is that those property owners uh, voiced their uh, approval of our project. Uh, there was no there was no pushback except for the Broadmoor property. Um, and uh, finally, to clean up the plat, which is in meets and bounds description, the city planning department is requiring us to do an administrative subdivision. That will be taking place prior to the case moving to city council. So essentially, the lot will become, uh, instead of the enormous description that exists now, parts of other lots, it will become probably lot one Security National Bank, something like that. Um, hopefully kind of address some of the some of the issues that were raised and if you have any other questions, happy to answer them. You brought up um, <clears throat> one Pacific place. So, so HDR is, has, has a new big building there. What's their, not the overall Exar you mean Exarvin? Exarvin, what I said. You want Pacific yeah, Village. Sorry. Yeah. Exarvin Village. Um, they're going to take occupancy pretty soon, it looks like. What's their parking for their office building? How, what's their parking ratio for that building? Uh, I'm not totally sure. I don't know right now. I can say that the existing office buildings on the site, um, the entire development, including on street parking, is parking about four to one usable which translates to about 3.3, 3.5 uh, gross square footage, is, which is what the city bases things on. And that's what we are proposing here. Um, so it's not, I, I understand what you're saying, that the tenant wants more parking in a lot of these cases. However, when the project is built with especially with parking garages and the reality shakes out they're not utilized the top decks you can look there's no oil stains on these decks um, and we consistently have the conversation of trying to push down their parking requirements because of the cost this happens to be an owner who's willing to do that and in the meantime we're still exceeding the city's code requirement what, what, what's the yeah, I know you you've got your heart and soul in this and you understand the project very well and but what what's the concern about taking the next 30 days and, and just trying to s satisfy some of the neighbors and seeing if there's some other solutions well because I don't think it's some of the neighbors <laughs> we've reached out to all of the neighborhood associations we've reached out to all the adjacent property owners and there is only one property owner who is uh, still has an issue with it. And we've met and had phone calls with that property owner on three separate occasions. And there really isn't anything in our development 
that can control the public street. The, I, I believe that one of the main issues is, the two main issues, one is parking on 101st Street. We don't have control over the public street as long as parking's allowed, then people can park there. And at the beginning of the presentation, I'm not entirely sure that it's office users that are parking there, that it may be trail users and park users. The second part of it was the idea that we're not following the procedures set out in the 1985 agreement. Uh, we do believe that we are doing that um, as there is no board that exists anymore uh, by reaching out to them individually and having the conversation. Um, so I'm not sure that we can achieve consensus with a fourth conversation <clears throat> would be my concern. Can I get a clarification here, uh, interruption, but on your recommendation from the city staff here, item two uh, basically states that, that any approval we give here really isn't effective until they meet these criteria. Number two says submittal of five acceptable amendments to the one Pacific Place Development Agreement, which is the, the uh, document we're talking about right now. And so what I think that says is somehow he has to comply with the terms of that development agreement, get the approval of this non-existent board or whatever it takes before this can actually be recommended to council, correct? <clears throat> I don't have the development agreement in front of me. Right. I'm aware there is some language that references all parties need to be agreeable to make the amendment. But I don't have that in front of me. Um, we would probably need further analysis with our law department to look into that specific language in lieu of um, hearing opposition and bringing that issue up. You know, we weren't aware of that when we put together our recommendation report. We're fully supportive of the project and the proposed changes, the parking, the office space, and whatnot. Um, well, but with, with some uncertainty of that provision in the development agreement, it well, it seems from our from our perspective, um, we our job is to look at the code compliance and all these other issues, and so like parking and issues like that. You know, it's been pretty well demonstrated that things are in compliance. What what Broadmoor is is alluding to is something different than us. It's it goes back into that agreement, <coughs> and there's a mechanism in place or was in place for the mutual uh, involved parties to be able to come together and police each other. They know better than any of us on what the parking situation is on site on that entire development. Well, so if you've got other parties that, that are concerned about the parking, it's within that purview that they can come together for an agreement to allow them to perform. Yeah, I don't think though the, the parking's not a question of of one of the changes to the plan. Right, yeah. um, but there are, you know, the increase in the square footage for the building space, right. the residential units. Um, you know, it's difficult. This development agreement is over 30 years old. Um, it has not been updated um, very well in those three decades. And, uh, you know, I, I can't speak for that. I, you know, I was... <laughs> I was in grade school when that was developed, so. <laughs> Rub it in. Well, I can assure um, you with, right. <laughs> with Noddle and Broadmoor's relationship in the past that we will be including them during these conversations with the elevations of the project, with, with everything else. Um, we're just not certain that on, on this particular issue that there is any, that we don't have control over one of the main issues, the parking on 101st Street. Um, and we do believe we're following the the develop the 33 year old development agreements um, standards for notifying people for trying to get people organized or aware of the project. <clears throat> You're familiar with that development agreement, then you you've mm -hmm. seen you've seen it. Crop so, it. Like from a from an industry perspective, you know, everybody talks about building office buildings when they're 50 percent or or more full, and they're comfortable building a 93,000 square foot office building without knowing the requirements of the potential tenants and whether they need more than three or three and a half to one parking ratio. No. 
Uh, there will be a process of um, marketing prior to construction. Uh, Security National Bank uh, has some overflow from other offices that they will be probably using some of the space with Security National Bank employees, but there will be um, more marketing before a commitment is made to break ground on the project to get near that 50%. I mean, as, some, as, as someone that represents tenants and, and landlords and, and I see office buildings, I can tell you there's a lot more Class A office buildings that are closer to five to one than there are to three or three and a half to one. I, I just don't see any new projects, current projects being marketed at, hey, we have three and a half to one parking, bring it on. and and. I don't think Omaha's know how to carpool, um, and I don't know if if the technology is going to change enough by the time they build this thing. And I don't want Landon's to have an empty office building, nor do they. I'm sure. I would respectfully disagree with your comment as well, so, because I've seen office buildings. Yeah, I've seen office buildings with parking ratios of three to one there, and they have excess parking. So now, you know, it depends now, on the use of the building. We, but I don't think it's our responsibility to yeah. say one way or the other. Would your, no, would your as bank long as it finances do that? I guess it, it just still comes back to me uh, for that that this development agreement because we're recommending that the, uh, you get a successful amendment to that agreement. The city's only one party to that agreement, and so the ball is in your court. If we if we move forward on this, you still have to figure out how to put these nefarious different entities together to come to an agreement. So that's my. Do we, Dave, or? We haven't had a city comment yet, so. No, but do, would we want to try to move this forward without the city having a chance to give review. a review of that agreement? Yeah, is, agree. uh, or if we move this forward, which I think we all like the project, but if we move this forward without that, we could just be creating a mess. Now is the time to lay it over for 30 days, is my opinion. I'd get a recommendation from the city. Yeah, I'd like to hear yeah, let's hear what it, Well, we, we will. Here. Are you guys have any additional questions or comments for Todd? I'm done. Thanks, Todd. Okay. Thank you, Todd. <clears throat> Danielle, the, uh, well, do you have to I retrieve left, something? Okay. I left my water. All right. <laughs> I thought you were coming up to talk. <laughs> You'll have to get it afterwards. <laughs> Okay, good, thank you. Uh, uh, let's hear the city's recommendation. Okay, well, as I mentioned, you know, <laughs> the city is supportive of the project, um, but in light of what we've heard here, um, raising concerns about that provision in the development agreement that multiple parties have to be on board with the proposed major amendments, um, I think the proper thing to do would be to lay it over for one month to the September meeting to allow city staff to further look into that development agreement along with the applicant and other interested parties. So we recommend layover for 30 days. I, okay, do we have a motion? I move to lay it over for 30 days. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote? Morris? Yes. Magid? Yes. Rosecker? Yes. Moore? Yes. Haight? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Okay, approved. Okay, that was the last uh, agenda item. Do we have a motion for the minutes for the pre-meeting of July? <laughs> motion to approve the minutes from the pre-meeting from the July meeting. I don't have that exact date. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote? I think it's July 11th. Rosacker? Abstain. Moore? Yes. Pate? Yes. Morris? Yes. Magan? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Approved. Okay, do we have a motion on the minutes from July, July, July 11th? I 
motion for approval of the minutes and the meeting on July 11th. Second. Second. We have a motion, a second. Lisa, will you record the vote? Moore? Yes. Pate? Yes. Morris? Yes. Magid? Yes. Rosecker? Abstain. Mr. Chair? Yes. Do we have a motion for adjournment? Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Magid? I'm sorry? <laughs> Rosehacker? Yes. Moore? Yes. Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. I'm sorry, Morris? <laughs> Mr. Chair? Yes. Approved at 332. Thank you, Lisa.